Moving forward. Right now, a future president could be running as a local candidate on your ballot. This person is vying to represent you, your family, and your community. Do you know what they are and what they stand for? Vote411.org is your tool for accurate and unbiased, up-to-the-minute election information on the candidates running in local races. Just enter your address to get started. Your vote is your power, the power to decide who represents you in 2022 and beyond. Get online, get the facts, and make your voice heard on Election Day. Moving forward. Aloha, Ken. Aloha. How are you today? Ah, uh, not too bad. It's a kind of overcast over here, which is kind of good. So, shoots. What's it like in Haiku? Ah, uh, you know, just another day. Beautiful for all the eye can see. So, <laughs> I don't know. I got a good view up here. I'm staying with a friend while I'm finding a place. So. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah. Are you trying to find it on Maui still, or? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm trying to move Makawao. Stay closer to where my, uh, my grandparents from. Oh, right on. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, let's dig right into it, bro. Okay. So, for those listening at home who don't know who you are, please state your name and what office you're running for. Uh, aloha, everybody. My name is Ken Farm. I'm running for House District 28. Right on. So we're doing a little educational part with these talk stories. Is we want all the voters and listeners to know what your office does. So could you please explain what the office you're running for does? So the and the legislative. Um, so we have you know three different branches, right? We have the judiciary, we have the executive, which is the governor's office, and you have the legislative, which is where the house, uh, house and senate are. Uh, and basically what they do is they uh, write, create uh, bills that may become laws. Um, they set a lot of the policy and the direction for which the state should go uh, in the different committees that they have. Um, and once that's done, it goes to the governor. If the governor signs it, it becomes law. So things like budget, um, different departments, uh, when you when most people think about things like, you know, like regular like police or trash or things like that, that's mostly on the county side. State deals with a new overall policy. Right on. Thank you for that. So before we get into your campaign, could you give us a little backstory on yourself? Uh, well, I was, I, um, I was born on Oahu. I was, I, I was born in Kapilani, but I grew up on the Big Island. So I live in Kona. Um, I went to public school all the way through. Um, went off to uh, University of Hawaii Hilo. Uh, got a degree over there. Uh, did some things around and went to uh, Oahu. Worked out and then things. And uh, just stayed in the, in town in o on Oahu. Um, I 
do some substitute teaching, um, some other things in mental health, minor consulting work, but that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Just a regular local boy. Right on. So let's get right to it. Um, what are the biggest parts of your campaign that you'd like to express to the people? Well, one of the biggest parts of the campaign I like to express to them, especially because, you know, the area that we have encompasses um, Chinatown, part of Aleva Heights, and uh, the area called Lower, uh, Lower Kalihi, where the Ibala area is. And one of the things that I always bring up is that we need to address the mental health issue in terms of homelessness, but also how do we go about having the right premises so that we can identify the problems properly and uh, start to develop the policies that will create the proper interventions. The next thing, and this is mostly a county level type of thing, uh, but the state you know, can definitely have some influence, is uh, recruitment of police officers and the police presence that's around, and also uh, the training of those police officers. Uh, Currently, there's about, uh, on Oahu, for example, there's about 300 officers that are leaving and about 50 of them to fill the spot. Um, I'm sure that some of those metrics are the same on the other islands, mm -hmm. but that is something where we talk about public safety. Um, you know, that's the, you know, especially here on Oahu, that's one of the biggest things. As you've seen a lot of dealing with crime, a lot of issues with mental health. Um, and because we're not doing it properly, we're seeing a lot of the results of that. But also um, looking at affordable housing, too, like real, true affordable housing. Uh, mostly I bias toward long-term rentals uh, more than owning because when you have to own or getting through that process, a lot of it is, you know, the 20 or 5% down plus the private mortgage insurance and, you know, the debt-to-income ratio for people to qualify. Uh, but long-term rentals and rentals, you can almost immediately house people. Right on. Um, so, um, big question I'm asking everyone to uh, give back to the community is, what do you think the people should be doing right now to help support your district? Are you talking about the voters in the area? Well, voters, not just the voters, but maybe even some of the people listening who may not vote or could be voting yet. Well, you know, a lot of... of you can have all the money in the world in a campaign, but if you don't have voter support, it means absolutely nothing. Um, you know, you look at the candidate that you align with the most, you ask the right questions, um, but also try to get a feel for what they've done before. So for me, I, I, I'm, the, you know, I'm the chair for the neighborhood board for Kalihi Palama. Uh, the other islands don't have those, but over here, it, um, you know, there's about, there's 33 boards. And for the area that I have is pretty much from School Street all the way down. Um, the the lower the, the left and right limits are the river going down by Chinatown and Middle Street pretty much. Uh, I'm sorry, okay, uh, I'm sorry, Middle Street for the neighborhood board and, and also Sand Island. So what I always try to do is try to keep my community informed, but also educate them when it comes to what level of government that you know, if you have a certain, you know, grievance or so, you want to make sure you're talking to the proper level of government. So yes. if we're talking about like uh, roads, um, potholes and things like that. Those are more of a county issue. If we're talking about things where it's, you know, the community colleges or other things like that, that's more at the state level. So it's trying to get them educated to know some of those things, but also how they can go ahead and allow themselves to just feel more confident when it comes to talking to elected officials. Um, every COVID, I've been more looking at just getting the getting people to understand the programs out there um, because we haven't done a really good job of doing that in terms of outreach. You can be on the internet, that's a form of outreach, but then how do you reach people who may not have digital access? We talked about broadband, that's a big issue. Um, but also the digital literacy of how does it where you have people who don't know how to use Zoom, you have people who don't know how to use uh, WebEx, yet we set a lot of the policies where we're thinking we're getting that outreach, but if they don't know how to use those things, then we're not really, you know, utilizing where it is. So I'm a kind of a creative person when it comes to that. So 
you know, for example, there was a federal program where there was about $50 off broadband. It's still around. Um, it was called the EBB, Emergency Broadband Benefit. Uh, and this was in the first CARES Act uh, during, the, uh, during COVID. And they're really, most of the outreach were done it on the internet. But in places like my community, I was trying to find ways to reach them outside. So non-internet outreach is what I would call it. Uh, to get people to sign up for, you know, these types of things so they know. Um, but that's still a big point, too, is how do we get outreach out there? How do we get people to feel more comfortable talking to their elected officials? And when they come to them, they come to the right department or office. So there's a little bit of education there. Hopefully that answers your question. It does. I, I, I've actually been talking to a lot of candidates about that very point, you know. I, that's why I, I'm asking all of you, even if it's you guys running in the same seat, you know, same office or anything, it's it's just trying to like massage the idea of this is what this this guy does. This is what this lady does. This is what, you know, so you, you know who to talk to when you have a question or you have a problem that you need answered or fixed. And I think that that really helps dispel the boogeyman factor of government sometimes because everybody's kind of come into this head cannon as of late of there's just this magical them that runs the government that we're fighting every day when it's really just us and apathy conflicting with our ability to interact with each other yeah you know, there's part of that but i think that you know there's that also where there's like you know there's oh there's this you know they just call it the government right so i have many times on neighborhood boards people will come up and and mention what their their grievances are but they'll mention it to the wrong department or something that may be federal right mm -hmm. thinking that they can go ahead on doing something um and you know you're just trying to educate them you know as much as possible on those the other thing i like educating people on is when we talk about affordable housing and what that actually means in terms of definitions uh and, and where terms like workforce it's not just a term that we just you know throw around and say oh everyone's a part of the workforce that actually, in terms of housing, is a, is a designated term um, that I try to get my community to understand. So you know, as we start to have more development, the question I want them to ask more than me is, how is this going to benefit the current uh, members of the community who are living right now, you know, as opposed to just adding more people in there? The current community, how does the current community benefit from this? Or can they, will they be able to benefit from the housing, new housings that are being built? Right on. So um, we've got a few more minutes left here. Are there any bigger points you'd like to elaborate on that you think uh, your constituents need to hear? Um, you know what? I, I, I just am more, I'm an open book when it comes to things. I like talking about policy. I like to ask questions a lot. And the reason I do that is because I like to ask the start to ask the right questions to get to the solution. And, you know, one of the things that I mentioned about with homelessness I see homelessness as, as uh, not just one big, you know, group, but there's different types of groups. So, for example, the best uh, breakdown I have, and I'll be more than willing to share this with you, is um, where you have one where it's a matter of circumstance, right? They lost mm -hmm. their job. They can't pay rent. Um, you know, the individuals that you and I can have a, con you know, as we're having a conversation just like this, right? They just need help to get back on their feet um, so that they can kind of move forward, right? Mm -hmm. Then you have individuals who are in the second category who are, you know, I would say cognitively deficient, where they don't know the reality that they're in. I see a lot of them in Chinatown, talk, you know, tie themselves, people dancing in the middle of the road. Uh, you know, it's just, you can pretty much see it for what it is. But the problem is, is we treat them all the same. Um, and those are the ones that are going to need the most help, care, and, and probably needing to do some involuntary hospitalization. The third group are the criminal element. And that third group predates upon the second one, feeding their habits, um, you know, drug and whatnot, um, and so on and so forth, which help to cause the issues of crime and violence even more so. And then you have those who are the fourth group, and they're I call the stubborn group and they're the ones who do not want to conform to the, you know, societal norms in a way they like being on the outside. But we have all these, these, you know, these kind of four groups and you address them very differently. 
So like, for example, the ones that are by matter of circumstance, those are the ones that we would want to use housing first, mm -hmm. in my opinion, because those are the ones who are going to understand it, appreciate it, um, and take care of it for the most part. And the ones that um, would be the best, at, you know, in terms of a vetting process. The second one, it depends. In some cases, we talked about involuntary hospitalization. I think that that's something that we do need to actually talk about uh, much more so than we do. Uh, and the goal is to get that person to be medically stabilized so that we can get them to a group home. You know, we, uh, we, we try to be at least restrictive in terms of the, uh, the care that, you know, the person needs, but we also want to be practical about what their needs are. So if we can get somebody who, you know, we can get them from uh, involuntary hospitalization over to group homes, that's fantastic. And, uh, and then you are dealing with the criminal element, and that's something where we're going to have to address probably, from the, you know, obviously, from a law enforcement standpoint. Um, and that's going to be a bigger discussion probably with law enforcement. Uh, but if, if we don't have these premises, at which how to break these different groups out, we're just going to address it as one big problem um, and not foreseeing it. You know, and this is just my opinion, how, how we should look at it, uh, in my experience in mental health. Right on. Uh, as someone who's worked in veteran homelessness for almost a decade, I, I appreciate your your understanding of of the different groups and facets of their life and what effects, you know, they have on each other and on themselves, because that's knowing each situation is very important. And it's very, very respectful to those who are in that, you know, homelessness scenario. So can um, I add something to that, if you don't mind? Yeah, absolutely. About veterans. So, um, and also, too, is um, so on the veteran side, because I'm working with this group now, um, trying to get something done in Chinatown, is where we work on uh, discharges. How do we upgrade discharges? So individuals that have served, uh, you know, past members of the uniformed services, um, a lot of people who are outside in the civilian world don't know this, but those discharges will follow you and it will determine the level of care and services that you may have. Mm -hmm. But if we're able to help them with the discharging, and that's a pro you know, there's there's different forms depending on what you know area you served in. Uh, it goes to a different department out in DC. Mm -hmm. um, but that has a tremendous effect in terms of what services that can be allocated. Uh, there's access, all those things that help save money, even from the state side, because the responsibility falls upon like the person was you know, a past member of the uniform services over to the VA or or. or uh, some level of service like that. So I just wanted to bring that up. So. Right on. Well, you know, I, I'd like to ask you if, if you'd like to come back in about 30 days, I'd love to be able to unravel these subjects a little more with you when we have more time. Yeah, that's fine with me. Right me on. So um, what's the best way everyone can follow, support, and interact with your campaign? Uh, so right now, um, as I'm still the beginning stages of it uh it's ken farm so it's a uh, ken farm for house at gmail.com that's the one that uh that's the email that i'm using for the uh for the campaign some people wanted to ask me questions or they wanted me to go you know deeper in terms of that i'm more of a talker than more of a writer i mean i can write but i like being able to interact with groups um that, that's always been fun to me. And I think that it gets the point across a little better than trying to write a novel in some cases. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So is there anything else you'd like to say before we go today? You've got a couple extra minutes, and I want to make sure everybody gets even time. Um, yeah, I, I want people to understand that, you know, there's a lot of programs that are out there, but what are we doing and actually to do the outreach? And what I mean by outreach is how do we get to people who may not have the Internet? Um, how do we get people, you know, when it comes to broadband and not just in town, but also from the larger statewide, um, because when we have these state and federal programs that are there and nobody uses it, it's just a waste of money. So then how do we get that outreach out there? I'll close with that. Right. Uh, well, mahalo for joining me today. And I look forward to going a little more in depth with you about your campaign and the programs you have in mind. And just thank you for your mana all today. Ah, thank you. No worries, man. Appreciate it. Right on, bro. Well, you have a wonderful rest of your day. Aloha. You too, man. Aloha.
Rabbit Holes is a Manava Cow production. This episode was produced by Kadika Hoek and Sarah Rodriguez. Make sure to subscribe and follow on your favorite podcast platforms to add our weekly episodes to your queue.